So welcome again. It's really very nice to have so many people joining us online. Um, we are myself, Niklas and Alexandra and Giovanni are here at the ISS and we are very uh, excited also to be welcoming um, uh, our speaker for the November uh, public lecture series, Dr. Bruce Soyapi from Northwest University in South Africa. Uh, those of you who may not be aware of this, the um, public lecture series is one of the central um, activities and, uh, of, of, the, of the focal topic of the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. And it is specifically a project where we focus on the different dimensions of justice within the sustainability context, of course. And we have a specialist uh, lecturer, which we invite uh, to present a lecture once a month. Uh, we have a range of these. They've all been recorded. They are all available on YouTube videos. And you are more than welcome also to go to our website uh, at IASS and search for justice and sustainability. And there you will find all the recordings. This recording will also be made available in due course. Um, but I don't want to take too much time of the super interesting discussion that we will have. Uh, perhaps just to say very, brief, uh, very briefly something about our speaker, Dr. Bruce Oyapi is senior lecturer at the Northwest University in South Africa. He's, uh, I'm very fortunate to say, a very close colleague of mine as well, and a longtime friend. Um, and Bruce works um, in the broader area of environmental constitutionalism and the extent to which constitutional provisions provide better environmental protection with a specific focus on African constitutions and African constitutional law. And Bruce has um, specialized and published widely also in this area, focusing also increasingly on the issue of uh, indigenous knowledge within an African context. As many of you would know, there is, there is often in the discourse, a predominant focus on uh, indigenous knowledges within the Latin American context but we don't see so much um, work being done um, and being discussed certainly in a broader sense, uh, focusing specifically on the African continent. So it's really encouraging to see that experts such as Bruce uh, are working on this and are um, doing specific research also on how African indigenous knowledges are used, um, not with uh, um, only informally, but certainly also in formal legal processes. And as you might have seen also from his abstract, Bruce's paper will specifically focus um, on the issue of African judicial environmentalism. And um, he will focus on a recent case where, unsurprisingly, uh, a carbon major, the Shell Petroleum Company, has been involved in South Africa. Um, and we've had um, several court decisions based on the activities um, where local communities have um, taken them to court uh, and successfully as well. And Bruce will focus among many other things on how the court also engaged with these uh, indigenous narratives. Uh, so without any further ado, um, I want to give the floor to Bruce and to welcome him to share his presentation with us. Uh, afterwards, we uh, have the great pleasure of um, Giovanni Mascherenas, who will also give a very brief reflection. He's a fellow here at the ISS on Bruce's main theme. So um, without any further ado, uh, Bruce, we welcome you and we very much look forward Bruce to- Bruce lost connection. Sorry, we seem to have lost connection with Bruce. If you give us one second, we will just restore that. We do apologize for the slight delay. We just trying to get Bruce back online. We'll be with you in a few seconds. Thank you.
So uh, we have a slight technical issue here, and we do apologize for that. And we beg for your um, indulgence as we try to resolve it. Um, hopefully everyone um, are familiar with, with these type of um, gripes that, that one can experience uh, during such virtual events. We are trying to get um, um, Bruce again online, and we'll be with you in one or two minutes. So if you want to have a quick um, leg stretch, we'll uh, appreciate that, and we'll be back in one or two minutes. Thank you. So for those of you who are wondering, um, South Africa is currently undergoing a severe um, a wave of so-called load shedding where our national energy provider simply doesn't have enough capacity to keep the lights on and they switch off electricity for the entire country during certain stages of the day. And this has just happened now with Bruce, but um, he has some emergency power and he's just getting rebooted and back on. So. Again, we do apologize and we ask you just to um, remain with us for a moment or two. We should be back online very soon. Thank you. And we have Bruce back. I am so sorry about this. Uh, <laughs> <it> wasn't. <laughs> It's absolutely no problem, Luz. If you would look at the comments, we also have other South Africans joining and they've been telling us stage four load shedding and so forth. So everyone is informed about the power right. crisis in the country. So perhaps somewhere in your talk, you can also reflect on the broader injustices being occasioned by this. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you very much for rejoining and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Louis, for uh, for the introduction. And uh, thank you to the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies for the invitation. I had a look at some point at the people that have presented before me, and I should say that the list is very staggering. So I'm very honored to at least even uh, to be given an audience to begin with for my presentation today. <clears throat> so what I thought I'll try and do today is so although my, my title seemed as if I'm dealing specifically with indigenous and traditional communities, I've tried to group together traditional and indigenous communities with the, 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 the secular communities we would have outside cities, uh, what some would sometimes call informal settlements as well. So um, you will see as well that in my, in my slides, I've tried to put so much detail and information, stuff that I might not be able to capture by my, my reading, but at least they will be available for you to see on the slides themselves. All right, so my goal is to locate the discussions around environmental justice and sustainability within an African setting and to specifically focus on one strand of environmental justice, that is the failure to allow for public participation in environmental decision making of communities in general and traditional or uh, indigenous communities in particular. So I chose this issue because I think it represents perhaps one of the biggest social and environmental ills that African societies face and because it reflects the presence or absence 
of environmental democracy within the African space. I should mention here that like Tangwa, my reference to African societies is not a universal claim uh, to some African truth. And I certainly have no agency to speak to such. Yet I believe the contestations that make up the discussion here are rooted in African history, which the majority of African countries share. So the discussion is going to be structured along four headings. That is the contextual African setting, so we can understand exactly what we are talking about and the realities thereof, and then sustainability within African settings. And then after that, African judicial environmentalism. It's a question I would have to determine in the end. If we're seeing any form of such, then I'll end with a few reflections at the end. So Africa is a very variegated continent, replete with a variety of cultures, peoples, natural resources, biodiversity, and a host of other unique things. Despite how variegated it is, statistics by the World Bank indicate that 27 of the poorest countries in the world are from Africa. And that if the status quo does not change, 90% of the global poverty by 2030 will be from Africa. That's about eight years from now. Also, in 2019, just before COVID, the World Bank revealed that just about 40% of Africans live with below $2 a day, with much of this populace being in rural and indigenous communities. Because of this dire situation, there are significant environmental concerns, which include poaching, deforestation, pollution, species depletion, and a whole host of other environmental problems. These problems have led to, they have led some to believe that Africa is inherently incapable of conservation um, or pursuing sustainability. This line of thinking then brings about the whole debate about environmentalism or at least around environmentalism. Now, without engaging in endless debates about it, I would break down environmentalism into simplified forms, two of which are the environmentalism of the rich and the environmentalism of the poor. The former is largely based on the idea of preservation and conservation, while the latter is centered on the foundational ties between ecological objectives and social objectives. In other words, the latter goes beyond considering ways of ecological preservation, but notes the inseparable link between sustainability and social issues, particularly inequality and poverty. So the question then is, do African states have the capacity Apologies. Do African states have the capacity to pursue sustainability or are African communities capable of living sustainably? I think our answer lies in history and traditional African thought and ways of life. Now, traditional thought sees nature as holistic and as interconnected as an interconnected continuum of humans and all natural objects which exist in harmony. People's actions and ways of life reflected the efforts to exist in harmony with nature. These efforts led to the preservation of nature itself. One could say they existed in African environmental worldview and ethic, which is centered on the community as made up of an individual, with the individual gaining worth as part of the community, or as others would say, Ubuntu. There are other African philosophies like the one from Igbo in Nigeria, which is termed live and let live or Dimalili Nduzu Azu, the life of water is the life of fish. So these philosophies, Ubuntu and live and let live, and perhaps many others, are based on the interconnectedness of being, a state where one is incomplete without the other. Within such setup, there is a holistic ethic of stewardship. In other words, Within African indigenous communities, for example, sustainability assumes that there is a moral responsibility towards the, the future and uh, inter intergenerational equity, wherein we use various methods to care for our environment. And this can be just demonstrated through various ways. For example, many traditional communities believe that uh, nature is the dwelling place of gods spirits and ancestors, and that abusing nature could bring the wrath of the gods or just misfortune that far outlives an individual. Also, there is the idea of biodiversity conservation through the practice of totemism. And here I might speak of uh, where I come from. I'm from Zimbabwe, and my totem from Zimbabwe is, is Shumba, which would be a lion. So ideally, we'll, we, the lions are safe from us because we, we, we can't eat them. Um, my mother is from the um, baboon tribe, but there are other people that 
have elephants that have rhinoceros that have pigs all the other animals as totems and the idea is that for as long as you have that animal as a totem you're not allowed to eat it you're not allowed to kill it and it exists to this day there are some meats i do not eat by association because some of my relatives do not eat them so these ideas involve the deification of some animal and plant species and makes it taboo to kill or hunt any of the species of that totem so these and other traditional ecological principles and practices of the indigenous communities promoted sustainable, sustainable resource management over long periods of time. One might ask, is this even important? And the answer is somewhat simple. African environmental philosophy or ethic is crucial to the determination of how Africans did live and ought to live with the environment. In other words, such sustainability history provides for Africans the moral canvas upon which Africans may advance their own response to African geological and ecological problems. Put differently, a society's perception, a society's perception of nature has a significant influence on how that society relates to nature, which could either be to preserve it or to exploit it indiscriminately. So to summarize on this aspect, I'll conclude that while there's much to be said about the poor, Indigenous communities and sustainability, I would state that there's a case to be made, if not now, then at least certainly in the, in the long past. Some of the poor and indigenous communities have long known about the need to preserve the environment. I'd also remind us that in traditional times, indigenous communities would move from one place to another when there were pressures on the environment. Incidents like the 18th century Mufetani saw the mass movement of people and eventually led to innovations like pastoralism and water harvesting. This points in some way to the fact that in their own way, African societies have always recognized the importance of protecting the environment. Also for the longest of time, immediate critical food and medication and supplies were all derived from environmental resources, especially by indigenous communities living off the land. In the traditional sense then, communities had to protect the environment not only for themselves, but for future generations. I would thus end by cautioning against the siloed approach to environmental protection or economic development where decisions are made to the exclusion of those closely tied to their lands and whose livelihoods depend directly on the environment. Ultimately, African environmental ethic challenges the assumption that only scientists or philosophers are competent to make ethical pronouncements on nature and how we interact with nature. One might ask if these Rather, one might ask if we can find meaning in present day settings from these traditional practices. And I'd say yes, even with urbanization on the rise, there is still a significant amount of people living far outside cities. And there are certainly traditional communities living in rural spaces as well as on the coast and, um, and some villages. And here I wanna just take you through a little bit of where I come from, just so that I can just paint the picture a little bit. This is me in January. This is a traditional community. This is where my father was born. So his father was born as well. And I always go there every year. This would be the land space. So it's not a farm per se, but it's a plot. And there's many of these around the space. Just across there, I wanted to say the horizon, but just across there, you can see the village. This is where we stay, not a village, but the homestead. Here, this is the fields. This is what we rely on. We do not have electricity here. Uh, we have to look for firewood and uh, we survive on agriculture for the most part. This is me just surveying the land here. Uh, this is the community. So you have these elders there, there. There's a fountain of knowledge. We sit there, we have drinks, traditional drinks even. And this is a delicacy. My auntie is drinking from a bottle. They're not used to that. So they're only used to drinking the, we call it mpomboti or the normal traditional foods. Right, so what you see and realize from this kind of um, environment is that many of these communities at times stand to lose a lot when, for example, there are development activities and just, just about 60 kilometers from this homestead where I am, uh, some of you might know of the diamond rush that happened in Zimbabwe close to about 10 years ago, the Chihazwa. And there were stories and even some documentaries made about blood diamonds in, in, in Zimbabwe. Similar homesteads as these were destroyed People were moved, graves were dug up, and uh, the government took over, the military then just took over and then went into 
uh, the space and then started mining diamonds to this day, many villages have not been compensated for that. And uh, they've lost part of their heritage in this insofar as it relates to land in itself. So it is not only a return, so it's not a return to pre-colonial times, um, which I'm arguing for here, but rather the thinking that goes with traditional African conservation, the environmental ethic that is associated with it. My hope is that this environmental ethic of care permeates decision-making and forms a significant part of whether we pursue certain developmental activities or we abandon them altogether. But as we shall see below, there exists a schism between legitimate interests of communities and state desires for economic growth and development. There could be various reasons for why this is the case, but I personally believe in some ways that we can trace this to the colonial legacy which African states find themselves in and which legacy has permeated present day development thinking. Now colonialism destroyed and supplanted African ways of life and beliefs to create colonial social structures, which were eventually left behind in Africa. This is what Carl White terms vicious sedimentation, a deliberate process where colonial legacies supplanted traditional practices to the point where colonial modes of thinking became the accepted mode of operating. Think about it. The social structures of colonialism um, involved, modes, involved models of development, capitalism, urbanization, industrialization, which all constitute enduring social structures and legacies that are active in Africa today. Most detrimental to the success of erstwhile sustainability practices, the legacies of colonialism led to the over-dependence on the, on the resource that Africa has in abundance, land, from which natural resources and biodiversity come from. This led to a lack of diversification of economies for the people, and if we are to be frank, Africa's current environmental problems cannot be detached from the historical context, particularly the impact of colonization on land and natural resources. So colonial thinking um, has to do with exploiting Africa's land space. This happened through natural resource extraction, agriculture and exploitation of biodiversity resources. It is thus not surprising that the many cases that are brought before courts have to do with mining, agriculture and biodiversity. To sum it up then, where vicious sedimentation meets neoliberal conceptions of development and economic growth is exactly the midpoint at which most environmental injustices arise. This is where contestations around public participation, exclusion of local people from decision-making resides. It is therefore no surprise that the attitude of some governments and their administrators in Africa regarding environmental values has been presumptuous manifesting in ways that assume that community interests and indigenous knowledge and experiences can be read about and understood with, and understood with sufficient certainty and clarity, which would allow environmental authorizations, for example, to capture what's at stake with sufficient certainty. It is this hubristic line of thinking which necessitates the need for a vigilant judiciary. Courts then become the last line of defense for community interests that are pitted against power of corporate interest and state interest in economic development. And I will try and show now in a bit that courts are assuming a towering role of what Elizabeth Fisher calls the stabilization of environmental disputes. So what do we mean by environmental um, judicial, African judicial environmentalism? James Carthy, from whom I, I adapted the meaning, believes it signals an emerging time when courts are using expansive interpretations of environmental provisions while assuming the rightful role of stabilizing environmental disputes. So what I'm gonna try and do now is to give you a number of cases, case law rather, where we have seen some of these community interests at play where they've been threatened and where the state has acted, how it has acted and what the courts have done about it. And I'm gonna start with Zambia. Um, I'll be dealing with about three, uh, three states. I'll deal with Zambia, I'll deal with uh, Kenya, and I'll deal with, with South Africa. So starting with Kenya. There is the case named Moses Lokwanda and Nine Others versus Zambia Air Force Projects Limited and others. What we see in this case, as we'll see here, I've tried to show exactly the applicants so we can see what's at stake and who stand to lose something in many of these cases. As you can see here, there's eight headmen and one princess 
who approached the courts for an order compelling the Zambia Air Force projects from continuing with their housing development activity pending a dispute related to the legality of authorizations for the commencement of the project, which was close to the Lusaka Forest Reserve. So you have a community that lives within a forest reserve. This forest reserve has so many resources on which the, the community relies on. And the Zambia Air Force Project, which is an arm of the state, wants to develop a housing estate very close to this project, uh, to, the, to, the, to the forest reserve. And by, by way of definition as well, forest reserves are specifically designated as environmentally sensitive spaces. And so they need protection for the very fact that they are vulnerable. And so the state, through its arm, wanted to build this. Evidence was that a river, that there were many rivers, but there was one in particular which could be impacted the most and which provided around 50% of the Lusaka city water and also provided the majority of water into the greater Lusaka underground aquifer. Without an EIA or adherence to water laws, the community stood to suffer irreparable harm due to the damage that would be occasioned to the river. The crux, however, which was at the development, which was that the development would dry up the river and the potential long-term effects of the project on the forest would only be settled at trial, hence the need for an interim interdict or an injunction. What's important to know is that the plaintiffs were of various chiefdoms and lands, committees, and they were composed of headmen and headwomen in various villages of the Soli people who rely on the Chalimbana River within the forest reserve. Important too is that the 10th plaintiff, Chalimbana River um, Headquarters, Chalimbana River's Headwaters Conservation Trust was incorporated for the sole purpose of conservation of the Chalimbana River. So after this development started, they gathered up as community members. They had the headmen who are um, the titular leaders within, say, a sect of the society which makes up a community. And they all gathered up together and they, they made a petition initially to the president which petition did not come back uh, positively. And so they then gathered up and then approached the courts. The applicants. The applicants had argued that they had not been consulted, that the project was starting without an EIA and that they stood to suffer a lot and that the river and the environment itself would be destroyed beyond repair. After the High Court had held that an injunction was not necessary since no harm would ensue, and I'm not sure how the court found this, the applicants approached the Zambian Court of Appeal, which would be the highest court of appeal in Zambia, and asked the court to halt construction works along what they believed to be an environmentally sensitive area, the Nusaka East Forest Reserve. The headmen and community members argued that the damage which could be occasioned to the land, the water, and the environment would likely be beyond their current generation. Thus, the Court of Appeal here was of the view that an injunction had to be ordered against the respondents considering, and I quote here, where there is a danger of serious harm to the environment, irreparable injury need not be proved. And the fact that damage to the environment presents potential and ongoing harm to both present and future generations, I find that the balance of convenience tilts in favor of the applicants. The case is still, uh, pending at the moment. The interim interdict still stands, but I'll show a video at the end of what is presently happening. What's important to note here is that they tried, as I mentioned, petitioning the president. It didn't work. And in an Ubuntu, in an Ubuntu fashion, they then formed a network of headmen and eventually approached the courts. So the case was not immediately about human interest. First, it was about the river and the forest reserve and it's potentially drying up. And then the untold suffering that might result if it actually dries up. So that would be the first case. The second case has to do again with a national park, but this time it is uh, a park in the uh, Kasanka National Park, which is one of the biggest parks in Zambia. The defendants had obtained a 5,000 hectare lease for building a wildlife sanctuary, farming and other building activities on an area around the buffer zone of the Kafinda game management area within Kasanka National Park. What's significant to note here is that the Kasing, Kafinda Game Management Area was a community-based um, organization that was created to manage the national park with the national government itself. So Zambia Parks would co-manage with uh, Kasinga Trust Limited. So they are a network of communities that live within the park itself. 
Now, this park has the largest known, and this is significant, there's the largest known mammal migration in the world as between 8 million and 10 million straw-colored fruit bats migrated to the park between October and December. Kafinda Game Management Area is within Kasanga National Park, and there are two community forest management groups under Chief Tambo. The 5,000 hectares encroach significantly into these forests. What they then noted uh, to the court when they appeared before the court was that the defendants had cut down a number of trees and encroached into, their, into the space of the, of the national park. And in doing so, this is what they did, or at least the allegations show that a river habitat had been disturbed, native forest in the Kafinda Park had been cut, permanent structures had been constructed close to the park, and, and that an important river had been diverted to support commercial farming, uh, all in the absence of consultation. So this had been done without having consulted uh, the, the communities that live within the forest itself. Although the applicants um, were not quite, the applicants were questioning the validity of the authorizations which led to all these encroachments, the respondents argued on the basis of property rights, considering they had been given title. And so for them, issues like borders were viable and they were well within their property rights to continue with their activities. The court in finding against the, uh, the, the companies here, it, it noted the following, and I quote here, given the competing interests, given the competing interests of the parties that form the serious questions that this court has to resolve, I'm of the view that the grant of the injunction to the plaintiffs will not act as device that by which the plaintiffs can attain or create new conditions favorable to themselves. The injunction in the circumstances of this case will have the effect of protecting the environment from any further damage, which as stated above, cannot be atoned for by damages. So again here, as in the previous case, we see communities gathering up together, campaigning as a unit in Zambia, as well as online. Um, this is one of the on, on, on online platforms they used. There were many others. Um, and their story was tied to nature and the survival of nature. And they used in part the migration of the fruit colored bats uh, to make their case and how the, the, the environment, the natural resource they had and the biodiversity would be impacted by the development activities. So all this could not have been, um, at least the rather the authorization could not have been given without these considerations being given due attention. And that is what they were arguing for. They got the injunction. And again, as you can see, this is a case from, from January 2022. So it is still ongoing. And the main case itself, which has to do with the granting of the authorization for the development of the wildlife sanctuary is still to be decided. Now let's move on to Kenya. In Kenya, the issue of the protection of marine resources for the benefit of communities came before the Kenyan courts in Muhammad Bali, uh, the case concerned the design and implementation of the Lamu South Sudan Ethiopia Transport Corridor Project, which seemed to have commenced before a proper EIA and strategic environmental assessment had been completed. So this is a massive project and it goes through about three countries and it's, it's um, believed to, after completion, it will be the second largest port, uh, port um, corridor in Kenya itself, the largest one being the one in Mombasa. The petitioners were concerned about the manner in which the project had been initially initiated in violation of the Kenyan constitution and of a whole host of environmental laws. They argued in part that the project would be disastrous to the environment because it would destroy the surrounding marine ecosystem of the Lamu project, especially mangroves, and the discharge of effluents would significantly impact fish species and marine life on which the surrounding communities depend. It turned out that the national government had not even uh, considered or at least consulted with the county government, which would in some ways be a local government, which ideally is on the ground and would have detailed information on the interest that would be at stake because it is the one that is closest to the people. Turns out then that 4,700 traditional fishermen who had traditional fish fishing rights had these rights at stake. They relied on small vessel fishing around the Lamu archipelago a strategy then for the applicants in this specific case, and this is important, was to show that because they had relied in large part on fishing, 
they had now accumulated what are called penumbra rights to such fishing practices. So in other words, because they have been involved in this fishing for a very long time, there's a legitimate expectation that these rights cannot be taken away without just cause or at least without compensation. Apologies. So for the courts, while they were not rather for the communities, while they were not necessarily against the project, they feared that their traditional way of life, which according to the court documents had been going on since time immemorial, uh, would be in jeopardy. And there was evidence that was presented to show that indeed, these communities have been living in this space for countless number of years, and they rely in large part on fishing. They agreed that the traditional fishing community, the court rather agreed that the traditional fishing community now had penumbra rights for which the state had to respect, protect, promote, and fulfill with the result that any limitation of such rights would need to be sufficiently justified. Furthermore, the project proponent had to go beyond the necessary requirements for determining the environmental impacts of the projects and the true costs, costs of the projects rather than um, the, the normal environmental impact assessments. And they could not do so without having conducted public participation. In other words, the court was of the view that if you are dealing with traditional communities and their rights, you cannot go about doing the normal process of a simple environmental impact assessment, which is why they were arguing that a strategic environmental assessment had not been done and also an environmental and social impact assessment had not been done. So as a result, the court was of the view that the respondents ought to make to take on board the views and values on environmental management held by the communities, very significant. The court was of the view that these communities had techniques of environmental management and that um, these interests stood to be affected. And because of that, decisions affecting the environment, environmental resources of these communities who are close to this environment had to be considered. The court held the court held the view that when dealing with the rights of indigenous communities, their rights are to be taken seriously, sensitively, and in such a manner as to maintain their constitutional rights to livelihood, where their livelihood depends on the environment, because failure to do so, another very important point, violates their dignity. So in other words, the court made a process, almost like a hierarchical process of analyzing the existence of the rights, the connection between the existence of environmental interests, rather, the connection between these interests and specific rights of the communities, and that if these interests are being violated, or at least uh, they, they, uh, they stand to be uh, affected, then the dignity of these communities will be affected, and dignity within the Kenyan constitution is a right. The communities here were able to craft their, their story in such ways to show that Environmental democracy is essential to realizing people's dignity and ensuring that those likely to be most affected by decisions must have a say in such decisions. The issue of compensation indicates that the state recognizes that the community has rights and that they are interfering with such rights. It thus speaks to issues of recognition and identity of a community with environmental interests worth of, worthy of protection. It also speaks to the idea of dignity, as I mentioned previously, recognizing the inherent worth of individuals and communities. So the big lesson from this case, I suppose, is that when faced with injustices or exclusion in decision-making, communities have to determine exactly what is it they need or desire. In other words, what interests are at stake and can such interests be compensated by monetary awards? So even if the pursuit of sustainability results in a proper balancing of environment or of competing interest, it still remains significant to know that the might be for or they must be compensated for. I'm going to move on to South Africa. Apologies, I have not uh, brought across this slide. I'm moving on to South Africa. This case, a few months ago, 4 May 2022, in this case, the matter involved an application brought by Community Environmental Justice Organization, Mkejo, Omsejo, and others 
to review and set aside a mining right granted to Tendele in 2016, as well as the review of the approved environmental management program and the appeal decision of the Minister of Minerals and Energy. The case had a proper A team. It had, um, I just didn't put the slide up here, but it had so many, and had so many NGOs. Um, but what's interesting is that the respondents, in addition to having all the the, the Earth 12 or the, the the usual suspects, that would be the mining company, that would be the minister, it also had four of these. This is the Mokoponyi Traditional Council, which would be a representative of the people within the council. Remember the case, uh, the Kasinka case in, in Kenya, it had, to, it had traditional communities representing the communities against the state and against companies here, the traditional community is against the communities, or rather the traditional leadership and the headmen are against the communities. There's also the Mpukonyoni Community Mining Forum, which was a group that was created by Tendele, the mining company, to liaise with the people, to be like the bridge between the people and the company itself. And we also have two um, mine union unions that were also opposing the matter. Part of the issue before the courts here um, was that the mining company provided false information or more frankly, they lied about the scale of its mining activities to interested and affected parties. They had misrepresented that they were operating on 32 square kilometers of space when the intended operating space was over 200 square kilometers as contained in the mining right. So there was the mining right, and when they wanted to do the, the impact assessments and public participation, they presented to, to the communities as if they are going to mine on only 32 square kilometers. Tendele had been, what's important, Tendele had been given a mining authorization on the basis of this information. What this meant was that given the actual size of the project, Tendele could not have accurately identified and assessed the actual potential impacts of the project and they could not have known exactly what community and environmental interests were at stake. The land in question also had lawful occupiers who had a right to be consulted, but had not, with the result that there was no meaningful consultation or free prior and informed consent from the occupiers of the land. Another problematic issue is that the mining company could not show that, the mining company could not show that he had made enough su or, or sufficient financial provision for mine rehabilitation, which is a requirement in terms of, of South African law, something which would have been canvassed through public participation as well. On realizing the misleading information that was presented, the applicants made an internal appeal to the minister responsible for mineral resources, but the minister with all the evidence before him and with his own wit dismissed the appeal in the high court. The mining company had to concede that it had not provided the correct information and that the authorities had accepted such incorrect information without verifying its truthfulness or to the detriment of interested and affected parties. With regards to public participation in relation to the defective notices and incor incorrect size of, of the project, the court found against the mining company, holding that it had flouted, flouted the laws. And these are some of the, the quotations that I have up front here that indicate what the court mentioned. With regards to whether lawful occupiers of land had been consulted, the court was of the view that traditional authorities do not always speak, do not always speak for, rather, traditional authorities do not always speak for their community members in that consent of such landowners was always necessary. So in other words, a company could not get away by saying that we spoke to traditional communities the circumstances of each case dictate whether you need to go beyond that and whether you need to involve other peoples as well. And such the claim by the mining company that the traditional leaders gave permission in this case was invalid. So the initial internal appeal, which had been dismissed by the minister, was remitted back to the minister for reconsideration in accordance with the findings of the judgment. And the mining company was directed to notify again interested and affected parties of their entitlement to participate in the new appeal process as part of public participation. So from this case, you could see that one, the state cannot always be trusted to deliver on the promise of respecting, protecting and promoting citizens' rights and certainly traditional communities' rights. We see here from this case that power, the power of communities when they unite 
is significant and they should be vigilant and not cower to the whims of the state and corporations. We also see that networks of various NGOs could create in some way a symbiosis that could help slightly tilt the power imbalances. Moving on to the second South African case, which is Kong Wasim versus Minister of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. This case, which was from 2018, it has it that during colonial times, the Dwesa Twebe community had been disposed of their land. And within these lands, they used to customarily rely on fishing and, uh, and, for, and on the marine resources of the specific area. After apartheid ended, they applied to have their land restituted, which land they had been dispossessed, and they got this restitution. A few years later, the government declared about 19 kilometers of coastline to be a marine protected area, which meant that activities like fishing could not be done within the marine protected area without a license. Effectively, the customary rights of access to the space around the marine protected area, as well as to activities associated with such space, were summarily ended. A few years later, two individuals were caught inside the marine protected area trying to fish without a license, and they were arrested and later convicted within the magistrate's court for fishing without a license in a marine protected area. They appealed to the High Court, arguing that they were exercising an existing customary right at the time they were caught, but the High Court found, found against them, even though it noted and agreed that they were exercising a, a customer right. So according to, to the High Court, a crime is a crime. Uh, and it was reading the law in, in terms of, um, it was giving a literal reading rather to the law in itself, the law and criminality. So the applicants then appealed to, to the Supreme Court of Appeal. And as you can see here on board, on, on, on the slide, you can see that the communities around the space also joined in because their communities would, would at some point might have also been convicted or they stood to uh, be in the line of fire insofar as convictions for fishing within marine protected areas were concerned. In the Supreme Court of Appeal, they mobilized and those with an interest in the case, as, as I mentioned, which included three communities, um, were also joined to the case. They framed their story, and this is important. They framed their story within an indigenous or customary frame. Part, part of the story was that uh, the man, that's Mr. Kongosil, who had been convicted, he was born in the area. He was a skilled fisherman. He knew the needs to conserve fish. His custom and the community's custom allowed him to fish and that the community members had ties to the fish which were crucial to the rest of the community such that, such that it included interest which spanned across traditional healing. For example, as you can see here, there was a traditional healer who also came and made testimony to the effect that she was used to going to get her medication and her practices from within the river. And it also started when she was 10 years old, so from a very young age. The court, in a very emphatic statement in support of, of indigenous communities and how they have a crucial role to play in sustainability found, and I'm quoting, customary rights and conservation can coexist. And it is important to remember that as regards conservation and long-term sustainable utilization of marine resources in the marine protected area, the Dresa Tuebe communities have a greater interest in marine resources associated with their traditions and customs than any other people. These customs recognize the need to sustain the resources that the sea provides. Then moving on fast to the last case, which is sustaining the wild coast. And I, I, I suppose many would be aware of this one because it's, it's the latest and it made quite, quite some news. It's the sustaining the wild coast case. So the case obviously had two parts. There was the first part that had to do with the interdict where shell had to be interdicted from conducting seismic activities. And the second part, which was part B, which is, was now decided in September, had to do with the actual challenge against the issuance of the mine, the, the exploration permit itself. So in sustaining the Wild Coast, part B, the applicants had secured an interdict against Shell and company. In the part B case, the argument resolved around the procedural irregularity, irregularities in the awarding of the license for exploration activities. The argument was that the exploration license should not have been given without an EIA having been conducted. 
if no EIA had been conducted, then there could have not have been public participation, which would render the exploration license irregular or illegal. For the applicants, the seismic survey, although not actual oil extraction, will disrupt their fishing ways of life, their cultural association with the water, as well as their general environmental rights. So a crucial aspect um, in this case is that the Minister of Mineral Resources had initially, although initially it's, it looked as if he was sympathizing with the applicants, he then joined in part A, he joined Shell and Company, so he was opposing the applicants. And also even in part B, he, he also was against, um, uh, or at least he presented arguments against the, the applicants and the court made reference to this, I don't know if they, um, I would say almost disapprovingly so, not in so many words though. Now in determining whether there had been public participation of interested and affected parties, the court found that Shell and company observing that whatever notice that they had been given calling for participation was out of reach of the relevant communities, even from a language point of view. Thus, even though there had been some chiefs who had been consulted, this did not amount to meaningful consultation. And we see again, this, this also relates to the case, the Mfolozi case, where the fact that traditional healers and traditional, not healers, traditional leaders have been consulted is not indicative in itself of the interest of communities and uh, singular people. The court further accepted that, accepted the findings in part A of the case, that it was not within its power as a court to question the sincerity of the traditional beliefs of the communities, yet it was um, a requirement and it was required of Shell to conduct public participation and to take the heed of the environmental and cultural concerns of the communities themselves. Therefore, the court set aside the license which had been issued by the Department of Mineral Resources. Now, in concluding uh, the discussion and the analysis we just had of the cases, there are a few reflections that I believe come out of this. And the first one is, I agree with Diana Abasi Ibanga, who holds that no system of African environmental ethics can survive on false foundation. And so we need to start figuring out exactly what our environmental ethic is based on, and Ubuntu might be a good place to start. So the idea that we don't have an environmental ethic and that we are just absentees walking cannot be true. We need to go back. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we in fact have that. Although we're not calling for a specific return to pre-colonial times, it's about that environmental ethic being included in decision-making or at least informing parts of decision-making. We also see that isolated indigenous communities stand to lose the most if they remain isolated. They must come together with other communities and form groupings that seek to protect their interests. It's true, there is power in numbers. And many of the cases we saw, they were able to craft their stories as communities combined together and the story read as one. And in all of these cases, they were able to succeed, at least in part in making a case for temporary injunctions. It's a different story when it comes to the determination of the main issues, but at least they were able to hold environmental destruction or at least a violation of their public interest um, or rather public participation rights. And also the management of natural resources in Africa should be participatory, inclusive of indigenous input and community-based uh, in itself, which can only be accomplished through the creation of powerful globalized alliances and networks of solidarity based in the self-empowered institutions of the local people. Also, interim interdicts are a powerful tool that can allow communities to strategize and organize, but they have to show what is at stake. And this is where mobilization and personalized narratives of livelihood become crucial to establishing a reasonable apprehension of harm. Also, framing of issues will be significant. Struggle across the board is about resources, about livelihood, about recognition, and about identity. If communities can show that they have, for example, direct reliance on the environment, they might be able to show that they have the penumbral rights associated with such environmental space. And lastly, they must try if they can, communities, or at least we must try to give these issues a human face, or we must try to humanize them, or give them also an environmental face. 
and make that and, and make the case that environmental dimensions are inseparable from the human experience of survival, as was the case in the Kenyan case, that is the Mohammed Bani case. The fact then being, if there is indeed an inseparable link between communities and their environmental space, denying them that right to participate is denying them their rights to dignity and survival even. So if the state does not provide for, for public participation, or if it does and does not take into consideration the rights of these communities, and it is denying the existence of the rights and perhaps even the dignity of these communities. And I think I'll end it here. Or rather, uh, apologies, Louis. If I may, I just need to show two videos. It's just five minute videos. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, just to, um, are you going to share your videos with us? Yes, great, thank you. It is a massive agricultural project which is aimed at producing wheat and other crops for local consumption and exports. Lake Agro Industries is setting up this project in the Kafinda Game Management Area, just a few kilometers from the Kasanka National Park in Chitambo District, Central Province. However, the project is surrounded in controversy as the implementers have already commenced the works without the environmental impact assessment being approved by the Zambia Environmental Management Agency. At stake is the survival of 10 million birds which migrate from various parts of the world and roost in the Kasanga National Park. This annual migration of birds attracts thousands of tourists to the park starting from October every year. Environmentalists fear that allowing agricultural activities in the Kafinda game management area, who scare birds and affect their annual migration on 25th January this year. Kasanka Trust, the organization which runs the Kasanka National Park, got an injunction in the Rusaka High Court to stop Lake Agro Industries and Gulf Adventures from their activities. Despite the injunction, the two companies have allegedly continued planting wheat, cutting trees, and collecting water from the Ruomba River. This has led to the organization applying for leave to commence contempt of court against the two companies. And Lusaka High Court Judge Charles Kafunda has granted Kasanka Trust leave to commence contempt proceedings against Lake Agro Industries and Gulf Adventures. Kasanka Trust contends that the two companies have ignored the court order which stopped them from going ahead with their activities in the Kafinda Game Management Area. For Shalala, ZNBC News in Lusaka. And so, so the last video is just, this is a trailer for one of the movies that is made in South Africa and I advise if you can go and watch it, please do. Even during Jesus time, there was brothers, they would betray each other. This mine will happen. This was the God that buried this treasure for us. Nobody will stop us. Mm -hmm. My forefathers died for this land. If I'm going to die, I will not be the first one. This has happened uh, many times in the uh, many centuries, as well as But that doesn't change that Lord is my cousin. <laughs> The president announced the king, our king in Pondoland was deposed. As Pondos, it's just only for us to decide who's supposed to be a king. Maybe this democracy is too democratic. Government, they see the king is a stumbling block. That's the reason to replace our king. How do you get the titanium wherever it's going to be? smelted and used. 
So that's where we come in with this wild coast road uh, development. There's just no way that anything against it can be found. You know what, Matiba, we call him the snake because he's moving nicely, smoothly. I'm the target. I'm the wanted. Nobody said, we fear Matiba. Matiba must not be here. No. If you're, you're a person have a mind and the eyes, you know your enemy. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce, and thank you also for this uh, very detailed and powerful presentation where, where you certainly managed to cover um, the multiple perspectives also that this focal topic focuses on, they mean the procedural aspects of justice, the substantive aspects, but also the representative aspects of um, justice. And I was particularly struck also in your presentation by uh, the one quote from the court where it said, positively so, that customary rights and conservation can actually coexist. But it also struck me that we need a court to remind us of this. And when we reflect back on what has happened in Egypt now and the strong lobbyist groups from the fossil fuel companies, you almost get a sense that there is this assumption from the big carbon majors that corporate rights and um, conservation should be able to coexist. Uh, and that, of course, goes very deep down to the type of discussions that we want to have also within this thinking space. Um, and without, I, we do want to allow a little bit of time for, for discussion. So, uh, Giovanni, if uh, you are there, and uh, we would absolutely uh, be delighted if you could give a few reflections also as a response, and also certainly from a Latin American perspective, uh, perspective on on um, knowledge colonialism, indigenous values. Uh, and environmentalism in a broader sense. And just again, uh, Giovanni is also a fellow here with us, specializing specifically, also a lawyer um, specializing in um, Latin American environmental studies. Thank you very much, Giovanni, for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, Louis, for the invitation to be here. Thank you very much, Dr. Brew, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I just took a few notes and maybe as a starting to our reflection, uh, colonization did not happen because one model of civilization was superior to the others existent at that time, but due to the prevalence of the colonizers mechanisms of violence. Uh, in talking about those mechanisms of violence, we also have to talk about epistemic colonialism, talking about placing one form of knowledge above all others, placing all other forms of knowledge of existing in this world as just beliefs, as something that is not scientific, or as something that doesn't deserve the same kind of respect and attention that this um, yeah, scientific Western knowledge deserves. And within this field of epistemic colonialism and forms of violence, it's also important for us to insert the insert that in the field of law, because the field of law and politics in Latin America and many other countries that were subjected to this kind of colonization, uh, this political system and legal systems is just a relic left over from colonization. Uh, so we have to understand also that the legal the law, the legal framework as a, as a system for in, imposing, uh, adapting culture and 
ad securing advancing economic interests and disciplining and, and educating the subalterns, those subjected to colonization, to the ideology of development, to this ideology of one knowledge being better, of one model of society being better. Uh, and yes, we will. That's basically that we have to understand also the, the, the legal framework, the field of law, the, the field of politics as a field a leftover from colonialism that has been used to impose those instruments, those interests against the former colonies. But although those are forms of violence, it, it is also a field of dispute. It's also a front that we can use to dispute those notions. It is a way that we can use to actually make a change. We have to also challenge this way of knowledge. We also have to challenge those forms of violence. And we have to challenge the, the same way of politics and law as an instrument of oppression. Uh, in this regard, I have to say, uh, I, I took notes out of, of a few things that happened in the recent past of Latin America, such as the Minister for Culture of this Bolsonaro administration still happening, that he said, and I quote, uh, I hate the term indigenous people, I hate them, I hate. There's only one people in this country, if you want it, you want it, if you don't, back out. Uh, and he concluded that at the end, uh, we, uh, we should end these things of peoples and privileges. Just basically saying, once again, there's one model of civilization, there's one model that we should all uh, abide to, or else we are not allowed to exist, just leave it. Uh, in 2021, Alberto Fernandez, the president of Argentina, also stated uh, a quote that says that Mexicans came from the in indigenous, Brazilians came from the woods, from the forests, and Argentinians came from the boats, from the uh, boats coming from Europe. So Argentinians would be better because they are white, they are Europeans, basically. Uh, once again, just showing that even in this high places of decision making, this notion of epistemic colonialism is not something they are shy from. They actually place that right in front of us. It's, it is still happening. But there are still some things that we have uh, in, in this notion of disputing this context of legal framework and politics. There are also some things coming from Latin America that are quite good, actually. Uh, Bolivia, since 2011, has recognized itself as a plurinational state, which means to recognize every different form of organization, of civilization, different people that lives and coexist there. Um, during this year's COP, the, the first left-winged president of Colombia, Gustavo Petro, was recognized as an honorary leader for the indigenous communities represented there at the COP. Uh, in Brazil, the, the now elected president Lula has promised to, to create for the first time a ministry for original populations which would be led by someone pointed out by original populations, by indigenous people. And finally, in Chile, uh, the president, Gabriel Boric, has stated that the Chilean state is in debt with indigenous people, and he promised to create a peace and understanding commission, which ought to map out the regions that are claimed by indigenous populations and actually try to give those regions back as much as possible, which can be understood here as we're discussing law as kind of an exercise of restorative justice to say we are part of something, although we did not cause this, we are part of the problem and we have to restore, we have to make peace with the past, we have to make peace and how do we make it? Uh, so uh, this legal, uh, this concept of legal, the legal framework and politics, they have to be recognized as fields of oppression and also fields of battle. We have to take them, we have the, to take battle to those fields. Politically, by allowing marginalized people, uh, invi invisibilized, uh, in, people who are made invisible 
by this whole process to actually access decision making spaces and to modify this you know, oppressive nature of the legal system and in the legal system specifically through battles such as those uh, presented here by Dr. Bruce, which seek to guarantee basic human rights, basic um, environmental rights or climate litigation. Um, yeah, that was basically what I had in mind to propose here as a discussion. And thank you very much once again, Dr. Bruce and Louis for the invitation to be here. Wonderful, thank you very much, Giovanni, for this extremely rich uh, reflections, which complement um, the presentation of Bruce very well. And I think that also really highlights the limitations, but also the potential of indigenous struggles um, in, in trying to counter all of these mainstream types of discourses and structurally vested um, interests that we are trying to break down. Um, so let's open the floor for a discussion. Um, I see this hand by Ilan. Please. Thanks very much. Thanks, Louis. But also thank you, um, Dr. Soyapi. A fascinating talk and also I think very helpful and, and useful framing, sort of broadening it from Latin American perspective from Giovanni. I have a, a as, as someone who has no expertise whatsoever in law, um, I'm going to take a little bit of a tangential comment here that maybe is useful, maybe not, but let me try it. Um, and that is that um, I'm very interested in the, in the question of narratives as insights into how communities view their world and how they, in fact, act on those beliefs and their perspectives on the world. And um, Dr. Soyapi made the comment about narratives of livelihoods, and I think that is exactly the right term, the narratives. That is, it's not simply stories, but they are stories that have the purpose of maintaining culture. And I just finished a, a few weeks ago at IASS with the uh, cooperation of, of, of colleagues at the um, Research Institute for Humanity and Nature in Kyoto, a conference uh, on the Knowledge, Learning, and Societal Change Alliance on narratives, and specifically with the idea that we want to set up a, uh, an obs a digital observatory of narratives of sustainability. Uh, and the point that I, I think might be worth considering, and I'd love to learn much more. I mean, I learned a lot from um, the presentation today in terms of those kinds of narratives. I think we could learn much more by looking at these across the world and looking at different indigenous communities, traditional communities. Um, I mean, I've worked both in the Arctic, in American, Native American communities, in indigenous communities in Taiwan. And these narratives are very powerful and very important. And perhaps what, what I had not thought about and that I really found important in this presentation is that that also then informs the legal opportunities and possibilities that go beyond, again, this kind of epistemic colonialism. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Bruce, would, would both you and Giovanni like to respond to that? Okay, I'll start <clears throat> very briefly. Thank you so much, Ian, for, for, for the comment. And I think you're absolutely right. I think what we see for the most part is that states have taken a reductionist approach to viewing indigenous rights. Um, and so they are kind of lumbered together as if there's just one story and within one narrative. If you know that they survive this way, then this is exactly how we should uh, address them. So there's no nuance, but then that nuance is very important. So for example, I gave my, my, my traditional community, we don't have any seashore, we don't have um, any resources that are related to the water, but we have our own narrative to tell from that end. And the people from the Hobeni as well, they have their own, which is separate and different, but it all is tied down to survival. 
to how do we navigate the space that we have. And a good starting point where and I think the, the law has not been useful enough to try and bring this across in certainly in South Africa, definitely in Kenya um, and in Zimbabwe, we have constitutions that allow and accept customary rights. So if you have a constitution that does so, these indigenous communities could be able to use that as a constitutional basis to claim their rights to livelihood. But we're yet to see that happening. It would be a good mix and mashup if we're able to argue on the basis of environmental deprivations as a result of their identity as indigenous people and then claiming protection um, because of the right to culture that is recognized in constitutions. Now, hopefully that's where the trajectory might go. But, uh, oh, and by saying that Linda Collins notes that, and this is a comment as well that ties into Giovanni. She says that our legal structures are not, are not uh, set up enough to accept hard ecological truths. And one such ecological truth is that traditional communities are the centerpiece of, of conservation. And if you deny, and if you lump everyone together, it means you're denying them their existence. They are indigenous communities because of their vulnerability. So if you deny that, you deny that they're vulnerable and that in itself is a disaster, I would say. Thank you very much, so. May I also add something, Louis? Please. Also, um, great answer, Dr. Bruce. Uh, I would just add to say that uh, this idea of indigenous people is not an indigenous idea. It's an, idea, uh, it's an idea created by the colonizers. So we have to understand that it is a, col uh, a colonial design designation that levels many different cultures, many different people, many, uh, uh, many different ways of believing and coexisting with the world. Uh, although this is a colonial designation, a colonial idea, it is an idea that makes it possible to bring all those different peoples all those different cultures into a single cause and to fight for that cause. Uh, in this regard, talking about the, um, the legal framework of law politics, uh, it's sad to see that not only in Brazil, but many other uh, Latin American countries, indigenous uh, rights and, such a, and also rights for the environment and such type of human rights that should be basic and granted, they are seen as concessions made by the state. This state that is basically uh, used for moving extractivism, for moving capitalism. So as an, uh, as an concession, it might be revoked at any time. As long as there is a uh, stronger interest at that specific point of in time, those rights might be revoked. That's what happened with the uh, right for uh, previous informed and free consultation that the law that instated that in Brazil uh, following the ELO Convention 169 uh, was revoked in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, or 2020. Uh, and even basic rights, such as the recognized right to the indigenous, to the lands that indigenous people tra traditionally occupy, those rights are also being mitigated to allow some specific corporations to mine in those lands. Um, yeah, it's a constant struggle. And if it is specific about, uh, specifically about narratives, I would have to say that there's a, a, a of work at least in Brazil from different leaders of different indigenous communities that have been actually working to bring their worldviews into our world. Uh, that's, uh, I would highlight the book, The Falling Sky by Albert, uh, Albert Co David Kopenawa and Albert Bruce which is depicting uh, a specific culture of indigenous populations in Brazil as seen by them which is really interested, uh, interesting. Uh, Albert Bruce is doing this work of actually just translating, kind of translating these beliefs into a book. And uh, there are many other different books about Brazil, movies and Netflix, where you can actually see how it is happening and how in different cultures, this appropriation of their culture, appropriation of their territories, appropriation of their uh, natural resources has been seen. 
Thank you very much, Giovanni, also for that sobering and very true um, perspective. Um, we have uh, Tobias. Yes, thank you very much, um, Brewsters, for the interesting presentation, Giovanni, for your comment. I have a question on climate litigation. So we just um, had the COP last uh, week, and there's a lot of debate, and you see that um, a lot of debate about loss and damage, and you see that uh, states in the global north are not willing to really pay for dam climate damages. So then another strategy would be to make uh, major fossil fuel polluters directly pay for the damages they have caused. And there have been lawsuits uh, from a Peruvian farmer um, against uh, the um, coal company RWE. Um, as far as I know, there have been no climate um, lawsuits coming from uh, from the African continent. So I would ask um, about, maybe you could say a few words about the prospects of uh, climate litigation um, for affected uh, people, communities in Africa. Uh, Bruce, you are on mute. Sorry about that. Um, I think that's a viable prospect. We are, we're in fact seeing a lot of movement in, in, in terms of climate litigation in Africa. There is a case that was just started by, um, this involves Uganda. So just to go back a little bit, Uganda has the rights of nature, but they are yet to use that or to litigate that in any of their courts. But right now they're suing total energy in France. Uh, along with uh, some some French NGOs, and I think they're dealing with the idea of vigilance. There's, there's a certain law in France that has to do with vigilance that you have to ensure that you've considered all the aspects, climate uh, or otherwise, uh, that have an impact on the environment. And if you don't, then you can be charged for that. This is not for violations that have already happened. In in terms of litigation against specific companies. So obviously we had to see that happening. Um, it will be a struggle. And I say this because we saw the struggle that happened with, for example, the Ken Saroiwa case, the Sera case, as it happened. Um, they had to sue Shell. They tried to sue Shell. They sued Shell in the Netherlands. They met with a little bit of success, uh, but it wasn't enough. They had compensation for the killing of Ken Saroiwa, but for the actual deprivations that happened within the um, um, the environmental space, that's the Orgone space, it's still a debate that is very hard to have and it's very controversial. Um, I would think that traditional communities would struggle. It would be up to states to take up the mantle on this. But perhaps if there are coalitions of NGOs that are able to specifically compute and specifically tie into what exactly has been lost, uh, and, and I use the word compute very carefully here, because that's another issue of how do you compute that and how do you really quantify it if they're able to do that, then perhaps maybe they have a chance, but it's also difficult as well, how do you apportion it? So I suppose within Africa, we will have to, to take lead from um, other continents and see how far it goes. But we have movement of cases. There's another case that has been launched at the East African Court of Justice that is challenging activities of Tanzania and Uganda insofar as the development of uh, some, some pipelines and how previous pipelines have been responsible for untold environmental harm, but it is still pending and it is still at the very early stages. I think that'll be very interesting to see how it goes. It's being undertaken by NGOs, by the way. Mm. Thank you. And I might also add this specifically three cases. The one in South Africa is uh, the Earth Life Africa case. There's one in Nigeria. Uh, Gabemre versus Shell Petroleum Company, and one uh, in Uganda, Attorney General versus the National Environmental Management Authority, that are very clear um, climate change cases. Those are usually the three that are touted as being African climate cases. And as far as I know, there's also a recent report by the London School of Economics uh, with Joanna Zetzer and her colleagues, who've actually identified um, almost, I think, 20 cases directly or indirectly dealing with climate change. That, of course, is always the debate. Actually, all environmental cases are climate cases in a sense, because all environmental matters also affect climate issues. So what is your definition of climate case? But um, uh, depending on how wide you want to interpret that, of course, there would be other examples as well. 
Um, perhaps any other final comments from um, the audience? Any other participants who want to raise anything? Um, good. So then at this stage, at this point in time, please allow me um, to thank Bruce for your very inspirational, very detailed um, presentation, giving an insight, a rare insight into um, African environmental uh, judicialism and constitutionalism and how this is used on the continent. Uh, thank you also very, very much, Giovanni, also for your very rich contributions and your reflection to everyone who has participated. Um, we really appreciate it very much uh, for your time and effort and all the wonderful insights and discussions. This will, of course, be made available um, to everyone. Um, and it, uh, uh, it's on our website, the recording. And please also look out uh, for notifications of our next public lecture for December which is in a couple of weeks, um, and we'll be sending out information on that. From the Focal Topic team, we wish you a wonderful day further. Thank you once again, and we look forward to seeing you all very, very soon. Thank you very much, and have a lovely day. Bye.